My name is Devrim Gündüz. I work at Enterprise DB, EDB. I'm a Postgres expert. This is my title, uh, at least. So I'm a Postgres major contributor. Um, so if you have ever used the RPMs of Postgres in Reddit, in SUSE, in Fedora, Rocky Linux, and Alma, this is what we support nowadays. I'm responsible for the official uh, RPM repos. Um, I used to be a, a website person in the past, but I broke it every time I committed something. I still have some commit access, but I, I try not to break it anymore. Uh, I also contribute to Fedor and Reiki. I'm a community member. I live in London. And nowadays, I'm also DJing, which is, I think if I get fired some, someday, someday, I have a backup work to do. <laughs> anyway, so I'll start with MVCC today. And um, I'm going to continue with the data snapshots. Uh, talk about vacuum, how vacuum is processed, and freeze, vacuum tuning, and vacuum full. And hopefully, we will have some time for, for the questions. So let's start with a star. So what is this? I mean, I'm sure you all know SQL, right? Or SQL, whatever. Um, what is star? Tell me. Sorry? Wrong answer, wrong answer. Not everything. It's, it's for, sorry? It's called, actually, there they are, is they are, for user defined columns. Right? So when you, when, you, when you say select star, it doesn't select everything, it gives you the user defined columns in a table. So it, 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 means, it means there are some columns in the table, uh, in, every, in every Postgres table where um, there are some hidden columns. So we will talk about these columns before we go into the vacuum processing. So if, how many people were here in the previous talk? So sorry about this, we will, because there will be some duplicate content, but sorry about this, but I have to talk about this before, um, uh, before going further. So in, the, I mean, in, in most of the databases, and not more, like all the databases have different solutions um, uh, for concurrency control. In Postgres, uh, for example, in, in SQL Server, it's, I think called SPL or something, I don't remember, and other databases have different implementations. So this is, a for, this is the MVCC, is the uh, implementation, of multi, uh, implementation of concurrency control in Postgres. It's based on snapshot isolation. So that's the definition in the, um, in the, in the glossary, let's say. Uh, the basic thing is readers do not block writers, and writers do not block readers. So this is quite clear, and you should also notice that we didn't, we don't say anything about writers and writers. So by, for good reasons, writers block writers for the, for, uh, to the same column or columns. So based on, I mean, I will give more examples in the next few slides. Uh, by the way, these slides are going to be online, so if you want to take a note, of course, feel free to take a, take a note. But uh, it's already on my website, very, very, like, that I last updated 20 years ago. Uh, it will be probably on the conference website as well. Uh, so, or you can just email me if you want. So um, we, have, we can have multiple versions of the same row in a database. So because when we run an update in Postgres, basically it's an insert and delete. We insert a new version of the row. That's where, where the version comes from. And then we, we mark the previous version as deleted. Actually, it's not physically deleted. We will get there. OK, we will get there. And there can be, there can be some uncommitted transactions as well, which causes the um, uh, multiple versions of the same row. And one of the most important things, probably if, um, most of the people probably have heard, if you are dealing with Postgres, the date tuples which we'll, we will talk about the uh, next slides, in the, in the next slides. So this is a side effect of MVCC. So, I mean, uh, there are some, there are the, I mean, on the internet, every, every, every time there, is this, there, are, there are discussions about which implementation is the best, every implementation has its own problems, okay? I mean, Oracle, or Oracle's implementation has its own problems, Postgres implementation has its own problems, or let's say side effects, maybe I should say, uh, but, but in the, I mean, Every year in every release, especially in Postgres version 14 and 15, which I'll get there, uh, Postgres made some great improvements over there. So um, let's start with some keywords that will make you sexy um, 
when you are speaking with other Postgres people. Hey, have you heard about Elisan yesterday? Like, what about to get, let's get some dinner tonight and talk about XIT, XID, stuff like this. So in Postgres world, uh, when, you, when you say TXID, it's called, it's called transaction ID. It's a unique identifier. Um, currently, it's t uh, 32 bits. There are some discussions, even I think, it, I think discussions started before Postgres 15. So it's been a few years since the discussion started about adding 64 bits transaction IDs. I'll give some example about that one in one of the, um, in one of the slides. So it's a unique identifier for each transaction, but it's a circle. First of all, it's a circle. So in a given time, uh, when, you, when, you, when you get a transaction ID, it's uh, either 2 billion, there's, I mean, not either, there's 2 billion in the past, and there's 2 billion in the future. So basically, it's a circle. It doesn't, well, there are some special, or let's say reserved transaction IDs. Uh, if the transaction is embedded, it's zero. This is reserved. And one is used during bootstrap, or let's say in the TV. And the second, uh, the number two is, uh, I mean, the uh, two is reserved for frozen, which I marked in red, because this we are also going to mention in the next few slides. Uh, so, uh, basically, let's sum up this slide. We, we call TXID as a transaction ID. It's, what it's, a, it's a transaction ID is, uh, is acquired for each transaction in Postgres. It's a unique identifier for a given period of time, but the current problem is it's just limited to 4 billion, um, which, is, which will have uh, some, some side effect, negative side effects, especially, especially on the BZ databases, will get there. So let's talk about more about the transaction IDs. Let's start with selects, which is a basic thing. Uh, actually, um, it utilizes a special transaction ID called virtual transaction ID. It's called virtual TX ID. And you can get the um, transaction ID with the function within Postgres in this, in this, speci in this specific transaction. So, um, and it's stored in the header of each row. So remember the first question I asked you about star? Okay. Again, let's we define star as it gives you it gives us the um, the user defined columns for the table. However, in Postgres and like in many other databases, there are some uh, there are some hidden columns which helps to, which helps us to sort the data, do the maintenance, other, everything, or let's say basically do the transaction. So uh, let's start with xmin and xmax. Xmin is uh, updated when we are running an insert, and xmix is updated when we are doing update or delete. And it is zero when there is no update and or no delete uh, with xmin and xmix. Again, there are some slides, in just in the, in the next few slides, I will, I will give you some visual examples so that you can see what's going on. This is just for the, uh, the, the theoretical part for now. So. Um, Let's, let's continue with the insertion for, uh, first. Insertion is done to the first available space. Okay? The first available space is a critical term uh, be, uh, because uh, when we learn more about vacuum, it's going to be more interesting. But first of all, um, let's say we have an empty table. And we, you know, you, you know, in order to even to delete, delete or update something, you should insert the data. So let's start with the basic insertion first. Um, Insertion is done to the first available, available space. By default, the page, not, not just by default, like 99% probably of the installations in Postgres world is eight kilobytes by default uh, for the page size. Um, so for each eight, kilo, eight kilobytes, so it's done for, for, to the, in the, into the first available space. It, the X min is set to the transaction ID because of this, as I told you. X min is an insert thing, and X makes is zero for inserts. So let's take a look at a, a, a good example. So we first create a table with a single column, which is one of the best tables I, I, I have enough. One table, one column, one scotch, one beer, all good, right? Um, and create a table. So in this transaction, you know, every, every, first, first of all, if you are not familiar to Postgres again, in Postgres, by default, every transaction, every, every statement is a transaction. So if, if you don't start the transaction with begin, like in the specific case, this is a transaction, this is a transaction, this is a transaction, this is a transaction, okay? 
So we have uh, basically four transactions in here. Anyway, so in here, we inserted two rows to the same table, and another one in here, another one in here. So first of all, we have star. If we, if we issued just a star, we would get one, two, three, and four. But in the specific case, in specific example at least, uh, let's say uh, C means C max, X min, X max. Let's start with uh, the four columns. We will get there. We will get C min, uh, to C min and C max. So X min, as you can see in C1, when C1 is one and two, the X min are the same. Why? Yeah, because they were inserted within the same transaction. So this is a transaction ID which actually inserted this, uh, these two lines. Oops, sorry. Insert also. So as you can see, next transaction ID and next transaction ID. Of course, uh, I mean, this is not a real uh, use, real world case. Uh, I mean, in a busy databases, of course, the numbers would be uh, like not in a, not in a sequence. Uh, but again, this is for testing, so don't worry about that one. So um, two and three. And then we have X makes zero because uh, we, we haven't done any updates yet. Remember the previous slides? When we do it, we need, it, it's going to be changed when we do some updates. And CTID is, is the physical location of the row in the specific page. So it means this is, this is the page zero, which, is, which means the first page of the table. Remember, it, it's eight kilobytes by default in most of the installations. So this is the first page, and this is the first um, uh, row, uh, first data in here. So it goes like this. Any questions so far? Okay, please. Um, when you say that the CTID says the page and which row it is. Uh, sorry. When you say that the CTID says the page and which row it is, how does it know how long each row is to know where that is in the page? Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question again? Um, so the CTID, you said it had the page number and which, where, which row it was in the yeah. page. How does it know how long the row is to know where that begins in the page? Long? But like CTID 02 there, is that byte offset 2 or is that byte offset 2 times? No, no, it's, it's the second row. Well, Se yeah. right, my, my question is, so a page is 8K. Yeah. How big is a row? It's variable, so how does it know? Actually, hold on. Uh, I got I got question now. In the next few slides, there is an example which is going to make things more clear for you. Okay. okay. Thank you. So um, let's go back to delete. Uh, I'm sorry, let's let's come to delete. So as I told you a few minutes ago, it's a logical deletion. In when you, when we say delete, it's not physically deleted. I mean, um, so my my partners were always just angry about me when I say, oh, I'm going to do it next few, in the next few months. They asked me to clean my room. Just I said, well, I'm going to do it later on because I'm a Postgres person, right? <laughs> we want to delay things. Um, so I said, well, logically, yeah, I, 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 I cleaned my room logically, but I do the vacuuming later on, OK? So that was the problem. So logical deletion, and the, because there are some problems with the delete, the, the reason is, even, even if you delete a row, another transaction may still need to see the previous version of the data. I mean, the undeleted version of the row, right? Let's say you are running a PG, running PG dump, don't, but anyway, uh, against a table. So let's say it's going to take four hours. If you, even if you delete a row which hasn't been backed up yet, uh, even if it's deleted, it cannot be physically deleted. Uh, because another transaction actually may need that row. May need that row is the key in here. And then we set the XMAX to the transaction ID. Hop, we have a dead tuple. Let's see. This time I'm starting a transaction intentionally. Delete from T1 when, where C1 equals to C1. Oh, oh, sorry. See? We don't see the data when we say the regular, when you run this regular select star, but we know that zero, one is there, 
right? And this is the first session. Again, I intentionally started the transaction in here. And while the transaction is running, within another session, I ran the same command. And now we can see something else in here. The, the other transaction sees the data without any problems, but Postgres internally puts an XMAX in here because any transaction ID, which is greater than, greater than this one, is going to see this one is deleted, deleted if the first trans when the first transaction is committed. When we commit this transaction, any transaction ID greater than this one for a while is going to, um, is going to see the data is, uh, is deleted. But it's physically there. Okay? So back to updates. Um, it's an expensive operation. It's insert and delete. Again, it's a dead tuple as a part of deletion. Let's see. And this is going to give us another hint about CTID. Um, we updated a row where C1 equals to 2. Just to, just to remind you, CTID, CTID was 0 0.242. For the next one, now we did an update, right? So again, update is, remember, insert and delete. So we inserted a row with a new transaction ID to the next available space. It doesn't have to be five. I mean, in the real world, you can see you are going to see some gaps because of the size of each row. It doesn't have to be one, two, three, four, six, seven. It doesn't have to be like in a sequence. It won't be in a sequence eventually in the real world. And now we have one is gone before because we, did, when it, uh, we deleted the first row. The second one is updated. Still, again, we start the transaction. Within another, another, let's go to another session. Now we have another session where XMAX is deleted to, uh, and, and I'm sorry, set to this transaction ID, 35. Let's come back to here. In the previous slide, the, insert, the insertion the, I mean, xmin is set to 35, which is the insertion transaction ID. That's the same for the deletion transaction ID uh, for, the, for the same row. Okay? For the same row. So the, there are two transactions, uh, two separate transactions, which are seeing two different versions of the same row. This, this version sees uh, the, the 20 version. This one sees the previous version anyway. Okay? So, um, so now we, we need to consider the huge side effects of the excessive deletes and updates, right? Because eventually delete, I'm sorry, updates includes a delete. So in prehistoric way, so how many people started using Postgres before 8.3 in, in this room? Huh? See? So this, this is pretty much historical. <laughs> like just the three of us or four of us. I, I think you also started Corai like before 8.3. Really? Really? I thought you were using before then. Anyway. So, uh, so per this uh, C file, uh, there, is a, there is a command in here. Now they are overlaid in the same field in the header. Um, and the, all the, uh, I got this information from, um, uh, from doxygen.postgres.org, which I found quite useful. It's a hidden website. Uh, that I seriously love. Anyway, so let's talk about the data snapshots. Um, it's not a physical snapshot, first of all. And we are to, when, when we say snapshots, we are more talking about the isolation steps. And this snapshot is created at the beginning of the transaction. It contains the committed data, and the uncommitted data is ignored within a, within, uh, within a snapshot. And this also, now let's speak, start speaking about the vacuum, which is the topic of this talk. Okay, in the, in the, it's 20 minutes, and it's my first time talking about vacuum. I told you I have lots of slides. Uh, it determines the vacuumable rows or non vacuumable rows uh, in here. So, um, data snapshots is important when 
there are some lo long grain transactions with uh, like PG dump, uh, which causes more problems because when we have when we have PG dump running against our da tables or database, let's say or schemas, whatever. Um, if you have uh, some dead tuples caused by deletes and updates, they won't be removed because PG dump, for example, in this specific case, or long grain transactions are going to need them. Okay, so long grain transactions are sometimes, uh, like often, cause may cause problems for the database. So we have two parameters mostly. This one, they are both they are disabled by default, and idle in transaction session timeout might be important because, you know, <coughs> in my when I I mean. When I was working as a DBA like a billion years ago, um, I had a co-DBA who started running transactions before he, used, he went to uh, lunch, <laughs> begin, update a bunch of rows, and he committed the data after coming from lunch. So to overcome that problem, what did we do? We fired him. <laughs> this is my way of solving problems. No, we, I'm, I'm just joking. So of course, we just disabled his access. <laughs> so anyway, uh, seriously speaking, that, that was a joke. So uh, let's talk about uh, uh, visibility. Um, so visible tuples, actually, we talk about visibility in direct in here, where this row is visible to this transaction, and this row is vis this version is visible to, visible to end the transaction. So basically, uh, the, the, that's, the, that's the visibility uh, comes from. And it is done by comparing xmin and xmax and based on the transaction IDs that the current transaction ID has. So only one version is available in this in a snapshot. So you cannot have both two and 20 of the same, I mean, I mean for, the, for, the same, for the same row uh, in one single snapshot. Um, the definition of visibility is the raw version, that raw version is already committed before the transaction time, transaction start time. So it is visible for us. If the, trans if the raw version has been committed before we start the transaction, then it's, it's visible to us. It could be uh, insert or update. Um, I'm sure every, uh, like, we don't store commit times in Postgres, uh, at least for now. And there are no rollback segments in Postgres, um, in Postgres either, because I mean that's the Oracle implementation as far as I know. So let's talk about Vacuum, um, which is I do every week in my home, home. Um, but it's not the same thing anyway, right? Um, it's a must-do maintenance process for homes. Sorry, it's a must-do maintenance process for uh, Postgres. So if you are if you are not so you may think that you start so some I mean when I told when we talk about vacuum uh, uh, to the to, to the nearly DBAs they said no we never run vacuum which is not correct actually even if you don't Postgres does something for you which will will get there we will get there so it cleans up no more needed dead tuples okay. No more needed. No, lo no longer any transactions require this version of the row. Okay? No, no, nothing is blocking this version of the row. So, and, so they can be deleted. Okay? We need to delete them. Now, now we are talking about physical deletion in this case. Remember, when we, when we say when we run the SQL, uh, SQL version of delete, as I told you, it's a logical deletion. It doesn't physically delete the data because we are lazy. And we want to do, do in groups, like, in, like instead of cleaning one single uh, glass uh, when we do the, um, the when we do the um, when we are cleaning our, our home, I clean ten of them just to save some time. This is the same thing. So it can run against a single table, a few tables, a database, a few databases, and all databases. So based on the parameters that you give. Uh, you can vacuum these ones. So it has two main tasks, and actually, I'm also going to mention about that one, it has three steps. It removes the dead tuples, and also it freezes the transaction IDs. The, so what does freezing transaction ID means? So remember, we have a problem. I mean, 
whatever the problem is, it's, it, it's, going, to be, it's, it's going, going to be the same problem in a larger scale, well, less scale, maybe I should say, uh, even if we have 64-bit transaction IDs. Uh, currently, again, as I told you in the very beginning of the, of the presentation, it's, it's a circle, right? Eventually, it's going to expire. Eventually, we will get there, okay? We will get to the point where, um, uh, where um, we, will we will issue the same transaction ID to the database. Again, this won't happen. Uh, in the past, like very past, <laughs> like probably before some people in the room were even born, uh, uh, when, we even, we, when we didn't have a uh, vacuum, uh, we, were, we, had to re we, we used to reach a point where Postgres shut down, used to shut down itself so that we can start in a single mode and kick off, kick off vacuum automatically, uh, kick off, uh, kick off uh, vacuum manually to be able to run, uh, continue running the database, okay? So that was, again, maybe 20 or 25 years, 20 years ago, maybe more. Um, it does not block most of the queries, not all of them, okay? We all get there. Uh, first of all, concurrent vacuums to the same table is not allowed. So you cannot run uh, vacuum against the, same t against the same table. You cannot uh, create an index when you run a vacuum, okay? Even if it's concurrent or the regular uh, create index. You cannot create a trigger when you are running a vacuum. You cannot refresh a materialized view. Uh, you cannot add remove columns. Uh, from a table, and of course you cannot drop the table. Okay, um, so it doesn't pull, block most of the queries. It's not going to block block your day-to-day -day queries. No select, no selects. No, I mean, this, you can run selects, insert, update the list. It can go on, um, but the unusual stuff or, or irregular stuff uh, will, be, will be there, and it creates I/O, and it's a part of the next few slides, and that's the that's the problematic thing. Uh, again, it cleans up the tuples, and it also cleans up index pages, which points uh, to the date tuples. So we, we don't uh, just cl clean up the table. If there, there's indexes uh, against the table, index or index against the table, we also clean them up. Okay? And it updates visibility map and free space map as well. And if we pass analyze to vacuum, this is not the analyze and explain analyze, if you are familiar with uh, the explain analyze in Postgres. This, it, it is something else, but if you pass analyze to vacuum or you run, run a regular analyze anyway, it updates, updates the statistics, statistics of the table. So uh, let's start talking about the vacuum process. It's done per table per page, first of all. Um, it scans pages for date tuples, removes index entries, point to the date tuples, and again updates these two. And finally, we will get there, truncates a lot of pages of the table if the page is empty. So if the last page or pages are empty after vacuum, Postgres is going to truncate those pages to save disk space. OK? Um, and there is there's an extra parameter about that one, which I'm go going to uh, talk later on. Update, it's going to update statistics. Again, we will get there. It's going to update catalog tables uh, about the last update of the relation of the database, whatever. So again, as I told you, Vacuum has three phases. The first phase is called ingest phase, also ingest phase. Um, it scans the table, first of all, and creates a list of the tuples. So it knows which rows the tuples will be uh, removed. It just cre creates a list at this point. It doesn't mean that it's going to clean every day tuple because of the visibility rules. If another transaction needs the previous version of the row, then it's not going to be uh, marked as, uh, mar uh, it's, going to be, it's not going to be vacuumed. So, so uh, first and second thing is read data into the, into the memory. I mean, the, the, the things into the memory. And it's going to freeze the tuples. Again, we will get there. And it's going to clean up the index tuples at this point. So it's, it's, as you can see, that tuple cleanup is not done at the first phase. Okay? That tuple cleanup is not done in the first phase. So it freezes the tuples, clean up, cleans up the index tuples, index, I mean, uh, rows, which point to the dead and remove tuples, tuples, and then done. So 
how do we how do we uh, control vacuum behavior? The most important thing, because one of the most important parameters in this case is maintenance work map. Um, it can be set globally in postgresql.conf config file, or you can configure, uh, configure it per session. I mean, if you want some larger, work, uh, larger maintenance uh, work maps, um, then you can use this one. Vacuum can utilize up to a gigabyte for maintenance work map, which, is, which meshes the on-disk data file size limit. So let me explain this one, what does it mean. In, in Postgres, uh, a data file can, all, can be a gigabyte maximum. So let's say you create a table, okay? It, it, it can span across multiple files, but each file can be one gigabyte. Uh, as far as I remember, this limitation comes from, uh, in the, from the days where uh, we could transfer between Linux and Windows, and the, the, when we transfer the files, the limitation was two gigabytes or so. So we are below two gigabyte limit. That's where the limit comes from, nothing else. I mean, not, not nothing else, but that's the... That was the uh, motivation when uh, this, uh, this was uh, set, anyway. In the second phase, the good thing happens. First, uh, the date tuples are removed. The, um, now we are talking about physical deletion of the row, of the date tuples. So it means now that there is going to be gaps in the data files. Let's say we have one, two, three, and five, and let's say we have we removed three and four, okay? Eventually, we will have one, two, and five, but the three and four, the space occupied by two rows, now is going to be empty. But Postgres is going to know about this with the help of uh, free space map, and the next insertion will be done uh, to that space. Okay, so basically, if you don't run vacuum enough on a busy table, we have an updated or deleted table, we have an updated table, your relation may go, may go like extensively larger, and it's not going to shrink, often not going to shrink if you, if you run uh, regular vacuum. But it won't grow up either, because in the next insertion will be done in the available space. So it's going to reuse that space but the, uh, the size on disk size will be, um, will be larger. So it also updates the free space map, is I, uh, the, the map where the free space is, and the uh, visibility map per, per page. And it also repairs fragmentation per page, uh, and this is done. And the, finally, it does the index cleanup, updates statistics and system catalogs per table. So if you look at the PG set user table, we are going to see the data about when the, when the table was last vacuumed, analyzed, auto-vacuum, and auto-analyze. It updates the statistics and system catalogs table, and try and case the final, um, last, let's say, not final, they say last pages if there is nothing there. So eventually, at the end of, the, uh, at the end of vacuum, the on-disk size may be smaller than, uh, than the usual one. So what has changed? Uh, in Postgres 16, um, the, it, in, in, in the previous version, it used to have um, ring buffers uh, to, to, uh, to, uh, to perform vacuum. In 16, uh, it, has, it, it saves shared buffers. It uses use a different strategy as of, as, of, as of version 16, and uses them circularly. This actually saves some space in the memory. So uh, if you want to get more details, the link is here. Um, I added the link for, uh, so that you can just read, uh, read more details from there. And, yeah, there's a problem. As I told you, um, let's, say, let's say we start the transaction ID 5, and eventually you perform 2 billion transactions. It's impossible, but almost impossible. But even, even if they were not vacuumed, if there were two, five, transa five transaction IDs in the same database, it will be corrupt in a second because, of, because Postgres wouldn't know which one is greater than the other, right? So that's called transaction ID reparant problem. Uh, in the past, it was a problem, big problem, because there was no auto vacuum, nothing uh, to, 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 to control this. And again, if the, if the database, the, I'm sorry, the DBAs, 
didn't vacuum at all, you would have lots of problems. But this pass was, again, 20 years ago, not yesterday. Um, so it's a must avoid problem. And if the, if the transaction is not known, I mean, I'm sorry, if the, if the transaction ID is no, no, no longer needed, I mean, there is no other transaction waiting for this specific row version. Remember XMIN and XMAX? Let's say we inserted something and no other transaction is looking for that one. Let's say we updated something, we deleted something, and no, no, nothing else is actually looking for the data at this specific time. At that point, Postgres freezes them, freezes the row. So now that specific transaction ID will be usable for us. Remember the 35, 34, 33 that we uh, used in the past, uh, we saw in the, in the previous slides. So they can be reused again. That's, that's going to prevent the transaction ID wraparound problem. And it uses specially reserved transaction ID too, which I mentioned in the third slide or fourth slide or so. This is always older than other, older than other transaction IDs, which is good because it means it's always visible for us. When we finish the vacuum, when we finish vacuuming, it's always visible for us, which is good. So at that point, first of all, the transaction ID is available for the, uh, for the upcoming transactions. We, our data won't be corrupted, and we are fine. Um, so again, as I told you, there is a patch uh, for 64-bit transaction IDs. Uh, so I went to their GitHub repo and extracted these two uh, sentences uh, from there um, because um, actually uh, having to vacuum frequently, freeze, I'm not, so sorry, uh, having to vacuum, uh, I'm sorry, freezing uh, frequently uh, co causes performance pro degradation because of the read and rewrite of the, all the pro not yet frozen pages uh, while being used. Sorry, I, I, I didn't paste the remaining one. So basically, it's a problem now, nowadays. So I, I hope that page is going to be um, committed. Um, but I'm not a committer. I'm not a hacker. I have no idea about the code. So we'll see. So let's talk about the vacuum problems. Please, I mean, these are in the order of in the PSQL, not in my personal order. So if you are familiar with, with, with Postgres and if you see full and on the top, don't kill me, please, because we will get there. I'll skip this one for now. Uh, you can uh, enable or disable freeze if you want. You can have variables. We always love variables, right? Because we want to see the details. We love spending our time while Postgres doing everything. We love debugging everything. Even, even, even though we missed the output, we love seeing the things Oh, things are processing. You just enable variables all the time. If you want to analyze the tables while running a vacuum, analyze means updating the statistics, updating the histogram uh, of the data in PG set, uh, PG set tables. So, and uh, that then you can also analyze uh, the, the uh, you can run analyze with vacuum. Um, you can also skip locked uh, pages, which is going to speed up the vacuum process, but then you may end up with unvacuum portions of the, uh, of the tables. Uh, but again, again, it's gonna, going to speed up the vacuum process because it's, it's just going to skip the lock. This is, not, this, this is disabled by default, by the way. You can disable index cleanup. Don't, but if you want just to process the main table first because of good reasons like uh, performance problems and et cetera, you can turn it off, but by default it's, it's on. You can just process the main, main table, which is on by default, but there's a toast table, table oversized storage attribute technique. So there, there are toast tables in Postgres. You can disable vacuuming, vacuuming that one if you want. Not, not encouraged, but again, if you have some problems that you, you need to solve immediately, please, uh, you can also disable that one. And you can disable the truncation process if you want. Um, it's on by default. And in the next few releases, in the last, not next few, last few releases, you can use parallel uh, jobs uh, to, um, to, uh, to perform the vacuum so that it finishes more quickly. In the, in the previous versions, we, we had one single one. Starting version 16, we have three more. Uh, and it's also available in 17, of course, as well. 
Um, it skips the database statistics, means don't update the database wide statistics uh, just to save some time and other things. Or just update the database statistics, do nothing else. So basically, you can run skip database stats if you are running if you are running vacuum against multiple tables in a single script. Run without uh, run with skip database stats, skip database stats, blah blah. Finish it first, and the last line could be vacuum. Just I'm sorry, vacuum and only up, uh, database stats. So then it's going to save some time uh, for you as well. And then you can also also set the buffer usage limit, which is also set by the vacuum buffer usage limit in uh, in postgres.config file. So vacuum and wall, um, you know, if you are familiar with Postgres already, uh, wall is logging of transactions. It's called write ahead log. And all the modifications are logged, all the changes, are physical changes are logged uh, to, the, to the wall files. So since vacuum creates, uh, does page modifications because it's doing some physical changes, uh, especially on the second and third page, uh, third, uh, third phase of the, of the vacuum process, it's going, to, uh, it's going to create some wall I.O. Um, it's also used because we need the same thing for crash recovery. And we also require the same things for the replica servers as well. You know, the replication is based on wall in Postgres, and most of the replication is done uh, with, with, with wall records. So we need everything to be logged to the wall files. Eventually, uh, Vacuum causes extra I.O. pressure on the wall files, which is going to affect your backups as well. Because uh, like all the tools like PJ Backrest or Barman or other stuff are going to uh, back up your wall files for continuous backup, and you will need you will need to have more space for these ones. So what about vacuum and replication? Um, <clears throat> you know, we, you can use replication for uh, say backup purposes. That's like the backup, not backup, but sorry. Um, like failover or switchover scenarios, or running some uh, read on the queries against the database. Okay, so when you are running uh, run when you are running uh, some queries which last longer than usual on standby, we have a problem. The problem is, you know, rows are updated in the uh, on the on the on the primary, uh, and vacuum kicks in. So we are we are in an update, okay, on primary node, and vacuum comes and deletes that one. So it's deleted on the primary. As I told you in the previous slide, it is written to the wall file and it's replicated, right? So in, if if there is a long running transaction on the standby which requires that row, uh, eventually we lose the row. And at this at that point, by this is the, this is the default, uh, by the way. Postgres just cancels the query on standby. Um, it says canceling statement due to conf conflict with recovery. So of course, uh, this, this, there's, a, uh, there's a solution for this, which is called hot standby feedback. Hot standby feedback gives, you, gives the uh, primary server uh, about long running transactions and says, please don't these on primary until I'm done. And the negative side effect of this is bloat. Because on the primary, uh, vacuum won't do its job, won't, won't be able to do its job. Um, so there will be bloat on the primary node. So again, there's a trade-off in between. So pick up uh, whatever you need. Um, yeah, bloat will increase. So there are a few things that you can use a throttle. You can use throttle. Uh, the vacuum process. Uh, by default, uh, it's, it's, there, is, there is no uh, throttle uh, on, the, on, on the vacuum process. So if the vacuum, um, the, the, the page which will be vacuumed is in the memory, the cost is one by default. This, the, these are default values. If they are this 30, it's 20. It's, it's, missed by, it's going to be read from drive. This is two. And if they reach, I mean, these two, three uh, parameters reach 200 by default, Postgres is going to, uh, I'm sorry, Vacuum is going to sleep this many milliseconds and then continue. Okay? So this is how you throttle uh, the Vacuum process if you are short of I.O. 
Again, this is disabled by default. This is going to slow down the vacuum process, but again, uh, it may be useful uh, uh, for you. Uh, it may, may, may be useful if you have a short of I.O. So it is going to result in less I.O., but the um, vacuum is going to take longer. Less I.O. over the time. Eventually, it's going to do the same I.O. Um, I, I feel like I, I, I'm, I'm like too old. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not young, but uh, I remember the days that we had, uh, out, we didn't have auto vacuum in core. Um, so it's been there for since 8.1, it's like forever, <laughs> anyway. Uh, it kicks off, out, there's, a, there's a process out called auto vacuum, which also does auto analyze. Um, so it, it, it is kicked off based on uh, some uh, parameters in Postgres config file or per table. You can configure them per table with alter table command. Um, and also it kicks off auto vacuum to prevent transaction either, either wraparound. So if there's a DBA who doesn't run any vacuum, nothing else, based on the configuration parameters in Postgres config file, uh, Postgres is going to start auto vacuum to get rid of the transaction ID wraparound problem. And this is a problem. When I say problem, let me explain what, what it means. First of all, you cannot kill this process. I mean, it's going to restart even if you kill it. And often, by Murphy Law, which is also available in Postgres, um, it's going to kick off in the busiest time. Right? So make sure that you don't disable it. Oh, yeah, it's in here, in the slides as well. Um, so it may or will prioritize some busy tables, so, and some mable tables may be untouched. It can cancel, it may cancel itself uh, if there's a, uh, when there's a higher log level is required by another transaction. So you may, you may say auto vacuum task is canceled in the logs because someone wants to, wanted to create an index. So eventually you may end up, don't trust on auto vacuum. I wouldn't trust, trust on auto vacuum. There are, I mean, don't, I mean, this is my idea. There are other good Postgres people out there who think the opposite. But I wouldn't trust on auto vacuum uh, by just, uh, just by itself. So there are some parameters which control um, uh, the vacuum, uh, auto vacuum process. You can, as I told you, you can tune it per table with alter table command, uh, all the auto vacuum parameters. Um, so you can just disable auto vacuum for some set, like static tables, like um, say states in the um, um, states in the U.S. You can just disable auto vacuum on that one because it's not going to change. But if you are keeping the number of women and children killed in Gaza, then you should just keep it enabled because it's updated every day. Um, so vacuum and auto vacuum, they can live together. Um, I, would, I always use Chrome-based vacuum just in case it's done uh, in a good way. So vacuum full. Do you know this song? Oh, yeah. Cut my life into pieces. You are, you are, this is my last resort. Okay? This is seriously last resort. Um, I, I mean, uh, because it rewrites the table. Means it locks the table. When I say lock, lock the table, in, uh, it's access exclusive lock, which means it's, it's going, no, no inserts, no selects, no updates, nothing can be done against this table until vacuum full is finished. That's why it's, it's last resort. But if, if things have gone too bad at, 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 uh, at, at that point, you may have to need it. But this is the only transaction that uh, runs against the table. It requires this space similar to the table size. Okay? Uh, it, it's a downtime. So there are some alternative exists. Uh, PG Repack and PG Squeeze. PG Squeeze has an, uh, is probably much better than PG Repack uh, because PG Squeeze has a sort of cron ish thing that you can also schedule uh, the maintenance process with, within, uh, within Postgres. Okay? So, uh, again, you know, we love variables output. This is the one of the variables output, outputs. I think in Postgres 14 and 15, um, people, I mean, some people added more output in here. This is one of the things that I really like, uh, one of the views in Postgres, which is called PG Set Progress Vacuum. 
it shows you, shows you what is being done, uh, how the process is going, and etc. Yeah, I'm finished, almost done. So first of all, thanks for coming uh, here. Uh, do you have any questions that I don't know, I cannot answer? Thank you. Do you have any questions that I don't know the answer of? Thank you. My question is you mentioned that vacuum does it on a per page. What if I have like three pages with one row inside them because of delete? I can't hear you. Oh. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so you said that vacuum does cleanup of the per page in a table. What if I end up with, because of delete, three pages with one row in them? One record in each page. I'm not sure. Does it gonna clean up and can compact the table or I have to rebuild it? So, pages, yeah, because of delete. I used to have like full pages and then they deleted the rows and now I have three pages, one. Yes, three pages. So it's gonna, do I mean, I, I'm, 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 I should, I'm sorry, why, I don't know why I do, I couldn't understand both of the questions today. I don't know why, <laughs> just blame jet lag or so something. So you start with three pages, all full. Okay. And because of deletes, there is only one row in each page left. Okay. And never vacuum the table. If I run vacuum, is it gonna make one page out of it? No. How do I get one page out of it? Full. So the only thing is vacuum full, which will do that? Yes. Okay. But again, again. Yeah, but don't do it because yeah. it clogs the table. Again, again, it's, I mean, the new, the, the, all the new inserts are going to be done over there. In the, on, on, in the, no, I'm in talking the about the static space. pages. That's yeah. mostly used in like warehousing. Yeah. Any other questions that I want to understand and won't be able to answer? <laughs> it's just a bad day. Mic, I think it's also being recorded as well, so we need to we need the microphone. Yeah, I, I have a follow-up to that uh, last question. So let's assume now that there is one row in each page in those three pages, and I update those rows. Now, updating them will move them most likely to a different page. Um, so if uh, let's say you updated the row in the third page, okay, it's probably. Uh, going to uh, insert the new version to the first page, the first available page. So it's not going to create a fourth page. It's going to use the available space on the previous pages. Okay. Actually, that's why we run Vacuum, to be honest. So Vacuum, I mean, let, let me explain it uh, in, in, in a different wording. When you run Vacuum, it makes those space as, as reusable, okay? For the, for the future transactions. So if you, if, you have some, some, if you have some space on the first page, Postgres is going to try inserting that row to the same page if there is not enough space, of course. Okay? I mean, that's a bit complicated, but it depends on, the, it depends on how, how much data is going to insert, how much available this space over there. It may create a new one if there is no available uh, space in the previous three pages, but often it's going, it's, it's going to try to use the uh, available, available space in the deleted, uh, in the vacuumed pages. Um, I think that it, I think they will be available in, uh, in scale websites along with the schedule. Or um, you can just email me, it's devrim.gunduz.org, devrim.gunduz.org. Uh, of course, without. DavidMetGunduz.org. I mean, I'm sure if you Google my name, you'll find me an email easily. Uh, you can email me, but I'm sure it will be website. I mean, I'm sure it will be on the on, on the conference website. It was a case for last year. Um, the, I mean, an older version is also available in other conference website as well. I mean, I gave this talk in other conferences, but it's all, I mean, more or less, it's like, like pre, pre 16 version of the same talk. The basic, the basic infrastructure is also there. So um, I have a, um, I have, uh, I, I do something after my talks. Um, there is a Twitter account uh, which is cheering for Postgres. Is cheering for Postgres, which actually 
raise your hands and we take a selfie with the attendees that I have. So if you don't want to be included in the picture, you can leave uh, now. Otherwise, I'm going to go take a, take a selfie. Again, this will be posted on social media, just to let you know. So if you don't want to be in the picture, let me know. Oops. Thank you. Thank you.